Hi, I'm Catherine Lee Scott, and I am playing Maggie. So this is your last day of recording the Maggie and Quentin box set. Yes, um, and I've had such a lot of fun working with Quentin again, with David. How have the scripts been for these? How have you enjoyed the stories you've had in this mixed set? Oh, they're wonderful. They're very fanciful. And, and, um, and I'll tell you what I really like is the interplay with Quentin. There's the romance there, but there's also the eeriness because I am considering, after having you know, had this wonderful romance with Joe Haskell and being married to him, I'm now contemplating marrying somebody who is uh, not mortal. Cullen's Fort isn't safe for your... for people like you. Not anymore. People like me? You're a werewolf. No. That side of me, like my soul, is trapped in a painting. You're still not... normal. I think I'm right in saying you've recorded for this box set in LA, New York, and now the UK. Is that right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, David and I worked uh, in a studio in Los Angeles, then I did more in New York. Now here I am in London. Is it difficult to sort of keep a through line on the performance and how you're doing it? If you're in different studios, sometimes David's there, sometimes he's not. You know, if I hadn't known David for over 50 years and his voice is in my head, so even though I'm listening to somebody else read the lines opposite me, I have the image of David. So, I, I, no, it's not, it's not difficult at all. Obviously, though, the days that you are together in the studios, they must be your favourite days. When you oh. get in with somebody from the show and you get to act against each other. There is nothing like it, and I wish that we could have done that. I mean, I wish we could have, you know, brought David to London. I think he might have enjoyed that. Um, no, it's, it's always best when, when the two of us are sitting there because there's, there is an interplay uh, between us. There, there always has been. You know, we've worked together so many times that there's, a, there's just a lovely little bond there and a thing that happens. But because the two of you are so good at it and you have played those parts on and off since the original series, I defy anybody listening to it to know which scenes they did together. Oh, scenes... that is funny. I, 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 was just, I was just thinking about that. I don't think people are going to be able to tell. No, they, I don't think they will at all. And since the last time I recorded a podcast with you, you recorded Blood and Fire, the big 50th anniversary story. Right. And you had everybody in the show. You had Mitch, Lara, Chris Pennock, Lisa Richards, Jim Storm, Jenny Lacey. That must have been quite a day. Yes. But, I mean, you've seen the photograph of all of us together. Yeah. Well, it was because we were all in the studio together. And, and, uh, and, the, and of course, when we weren't actually on the microphone, we were uh, outside the booth jabbering away because we, we just know each other so well. But I think the, the, the really the greatest treat for me that day was to be working with Mitch Ryan. You know I love him. I, I, I just remember him from the very early days of the show. And uh, I've always kind of looked up to him and, and just felt a, a, real, a real closeness to him. I'm, I'm just delighted that he could come in and do the work. It was you in the first place <laughs> that said, let's get Mitch in. I'm sure that he'll come in and do it. And he's now done and read all over and blood and fire. I know. No, I know. Well, I took him to lunch, and we hadn't eat, we hadn't seen each other for a while. But I took him to lunch, and I and I kind of uh, schmoozed him a bit. And uh, actually, he he was he was all for it. He was delighted. I think he was wondering when he was going to be asked. <gasps> Joe, is that you? <sighs> Who are you? Where am I? What the hell? I know you. You can. What's your name? Devlin. My name's Devlin. <laughs> Dark shadows. And red all over. Hey, lady. Is that yours? What? Well, it says Mrs. Maggie Haskell on it, and that ain't me. Give me that. Maggie, we have Joe. If you help us get what we want by sunset, he will be released unharmed. Oh, God. <laughs> Look, there, near the trees. What? Men. I can't see. Are, are they men in suits? They won't let you leave. Well, why are they just standing there? What do they want? And why can't I see their faces? <laughs> the ink is a South American organization with fingers in everything. They are very secretive. And rumor had it that they are mixed up with the occult, black magic. 
Mucumba, as they say in Brazil. Oh, come on. Black magic. You don't believe in the supernatural, Maggie? Of course not. <laughs> it's hot like fire. Fire all around me. But it's not hurting me. The flames aren't hurting me. Burke, where are you? I'm on the plane. Everyone's in their seats, and they're burning. They're dead. I'm surrounded by the burning dead. <laughs> Maggie, quiet for a second. What? What is it? One of them watching through the window. It wants you to turn around. How did you enjoy the big 50th anniversary Oh, weekend? I loved it. I loved it. I wish it could have been in a bigger venue so that more people could have attended. But for, for me, it was, uh, it was a bit emotional because I was on the very first day. And I wished that, you know, more, more of us, you know, could have, uh, could have been there. One is always thinking about those who uh, are no longer with us. And that, uh, that was emotional. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I adored Joel Crothers. Uh, I miss him terribly. We no longer have Humbert with us or Louie or Joan. And, uh, and I, really, I really felt their loss. But it was a joyful occasion too. I mean, it was really, it was really fun that there were so many people that, that you know, g kind of grew up watching us, and and now that they're, you know, they've got children of their own, grandchildren in some cases, uh, they 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 came to kind of celebrate with us. You mentioned Joel there. Yeah. Within this box set, there's some lovely Joel Haskell. Yes, and I, I think of Joel. I picture Joel when I'm um, I, I'm recording. Uh, he was just a lovely man, uh, and he just left us all too soon. What, 1985? Oh, a very young man. Oh, very it? young man, and he was just—he was just a wonderful person. There's so many of these people that you named that I would love to have <laughs> got behind the big finish oh, microphone. Now, yeah. tell me, don't you think it would be wonderful to have Louis and Joan? Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh! Imagine the two of them, and and Humbert, you know, with that wonderful voice of his. Oh, yeah, that would be that would be wonderful. Is there anything? Life that you would specifically really love to do with the audios? Is there someone you'd really love to work with? Oh my gosh, I, I've, uh, I, I can't think of anybody now who we haven't worked with. Have, haven't we worked with everybody? Pitten, pitten. I think that you, you've even had um, Donna McKechnie. Yeah. And uh, you know, Donna and I are so, we're close. I'm, I'm very fond of her. I think I think I've worked with just about everybody. Catherine Lee Scott, thank you very much. Thank you very we much. Can go, we can go and have a glass of wine Ooh. now. <laughs> Dark shadows beyond the grave. Ladies and gentlemen, we apologise again for the difficulties we've been having. Can't you hear, Can't you hear her screaming? screaming? If you'll excuse the expression, it seems we have a ghost in the machine. <laughs> Someone's hurting her. I'm imagining it, don't you? 40 years ago, the paranormal television show Beyond the Grave broadcast a very special Halloween episode live from Collinsport, Maine. Presenters Tom Lacey and Kate Ripperton introduced the nation to the legend of Mad Jack, the local fisherman who had reportedly haunted the town cemetery for over six decades. The terrifying events that followed have become infamous. Suppressed and denied by the authorities, the episode was thought lost forever. Until now. Now, for the first time in 40 years, you can hear the true horror of that fateful night in Collinsport. Somebody's hurting her! Dark Shadows, the Harvest of Souls. Miss Jennings? Miss Jennings, are you awake? They've stopped broadcasting and nobody's been brought in for a while. The producer of Beyond the Grave has confirmed that the show was intended as a different kind of drama and nothing more. The coincidence of it being broadcast at the same time as the gas leak in Collinsport has been described as just that, a tragic coincidence. Maggie Evans, the Collinsport resident heard in the broadcast, has been unavailable for comment. 
Happy now, Collinsport? <laughs> Happy? You've finally got what you want, haven't you? Me. Do you really think people can come back from the dead? I don't know. I hope so. <sighs> Me too. Can I get a coffee over here? Hey, just a minute. Can't you see that I... Jim? Uh, Jim Hardy? M Miss Evans. My name is Maggie Evans, and this is the end of my story. Maggie Evans, the woman who failed. Easy, Hello. Daisy. Hello, who are you? I am various people today. I am Mrs. Bailey, and I am Jacques Lopez. Um, both of whom are maybe not what they seem at first. How have you enjoyed the UK Dark Shadows experience? Oh, it's just fantastic. I've recorded a bit of Dark Shadows in Los Angeles for you guys, mm. but there's nothing like being here in the studio with all of you on Joe's last day of being in his 30s, by the way. Uh, and it's just, it's just truly a joy. I mean, even the ride over here, I was getting sort of silly and a little bit giddy because I knew it was just going to be a fantastic afternoon. How has Mr. Lidster been reading in all the other parts for you? Well, I'll tell you what, he has been nothing short of dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> he said, do you want me to give you moans and wails? You don't need moans and wails, do you, Daisy? And I said, oh, no, I need the moaning and wailing, absolutely. I mean, oh. I'm not the only one that's working here. we got to make him do a little something. But he, you know, he keeps it going so well, and his direction is always right on. So, you've read the scripts before you've come along, because you're preparing yes, all these things. always. How much do you have your voices in your head? There seemed to be a bit of discussion, like well, Mrs. Bailey. Bailey, first of all. Well, Mrs. Bailey, first of all, I wasn't sure if maybe you uh, you guys wanted her to be Irish, you know, with her name, and indeed, you know, her lover is Patrick. These are all very Irish names. And then we decided let's let's keep it very dark shadows. Let's keep it with that sort of East Coasty American feel. But in my head, I'd had her in a variety of guises, including as an Irish maid, you know, who's come over to America, as so many people did, um, and in, indeed still do, and with uh, Jacquelle Pe. Hey, I it's funny because Alan and I had gone back and forth just a little bit on email and we had both had the same voice in our head, which was um, for those of you who are lost fans. Me? I, yay, am, I love yay. lost. I'm such a lost nerd. Um, but it's the voice basically of Danielle Rousseau. Not so much her voice, but using that as inspiration. Yeah, oh, I hate to say it. She was my muse. <laughs> as we've said, neither character turns out to be what they seem to be, do they? No. Which, for me, is super fun. <laughs> um, it's great being able to start with one point of view and a bit of a, a bit of one tone in your voice, and then by the end, you know, you've completely transformed into something else. And, you know, I'd love to say that's a normal Wednesday for me. <laughs> <laughs> Quentin, my dear boy, you are but a pup to me. So young and full of life and innocence. Innocence? I think you've actually left him speechless. Just how much do you feel part of the Dark Shadows family now, then? Well, I'm beginning to feel more and more... Uh, uh, let's put it this way. I'm feeling less like a cousin and more like a sister. <laughs> <laughs> That's what um, but it's it's always been such a happy, happy, happy collaboration for me. And I have to, I have to stop and thank Catherine Lee Scott because it was her that originally said to you guys, hey, you know, check out Daisy Torme. And I am eternally grateful to her, not just because of the work, but because of also these great friendships that we forged. I mean, we're sitting here. We're going to go grab some drinks and some dinner after. We are genuinely a little crazy Dark Shadows family, and I feel really blessed to be a part of uh, this kooky, dysfunctional group. Since the last time we spoke when we did our podcast together, what have you been up to? What, what works have you been doing? Well, I've been up to quite a bit. Um, I think I probably told you last year that I'd written a script called mm. Annoying Island. Uh, that is currently... Damned Island! Yeah, it's a damned island. Um, that is currently, um, gosh, it's such a pun, but floating around uh. Hollywood. Um, and hopefully it will be floating around London sooner or later. And I started writing a book, which I really have to say I'm trying to write a book. I, I will honestly be really shocked if I can 
actually pull this off and finish it. But I'm basically trying to write, well, it's the stuff that you and I love. It's, you know, all the kind of mystery mm-hmm. stuff. And I'm, I'm sort of trying to write a book that I would want to read. Um, so that's been one side of my life. And on the other, I've been just really fortunate with a lot more voice work. I worked on every episode of um, the upcoming series called Feud, which is about the feud between Betty Davis and Joan Crawford. I know exactly. I haven't seen it, so, but I know the show you well, mean. Well, if you watch the show by just looking at the wall and you put your ear to the screen, you will hear me in the background of just about every episode. And actually, you know what? Let me do a plug. Yep. In the very first episode of Feud, you will hear Mel Torme singing. And I did not know this. I went in and I worked, and they all knew, and mm. no one told me. And when I watched the first episode, which I I rarely watch stuff that I've worked in because I've already kind yes. of seen it. Um, but I sat watching this because I just love that old Hollywood scandal and juice. Um, and right in the middle of the episode, I mean, I sat up bolt straight as if a piece of lightning had just hit me and there was my dad singing this wonderful song called In the Evening and um, it was as my brother James said, hey two Tormes in one hit show, what more could you want? And it was just one of those great moments. My dad and I, our voices have never been in the same show ever, except for once when we actually worked together and that was obviously on purpose. This was totally by chance and a real thrill and it's done by the same guys that do Glee and American Horror Story and American Crime Story and so I think it's going to do really well over here the cast is unparalleled I mean I'm just I'm just doing some voice stuff in there but when you consider Susan Sarandon and Jessica Lang Jessica Lang has been in every season mm-hmm. of American Horror Story so she and Ryan Murphy have this wonderful collaboration and um, Alfred Molina's in it I mean Everyone's in it, and everyone's having the time of their lives. I emailed you the other week because mm-hmm. I was just happening to be watching Dusty at the BBC. That's right. And suddenly up pops Mel to me. Yay. And I got told off because my reaction was, I was watching and I said, oh, is that Mel? And I was told, you don't know him, but you don't need to get that excited. You know what? I think at this point we're all family <laughs> yeah, here. You so. can absolutely do that. And I would love, I, I love all that stuff. And mm. you and I, we did. Mm. We went back and forth about it. And I said, I love when this happens. And indeed, the other day um, on Twitter, which sometimes we mm. see each other on Twitter as well, someone sent me a picture of their new dog, whose name is Mel Torme Murphy or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I said, my dad would be very proud. I mean, he, he loves the love from down here. I'm sure up there he's he's uh, enjoying every minute of it. Having seen you hard at work today, I'm sure they would be very proud. Oh, well, so. bless. It's, it is a labour of love. This is such an enjoyment, honestly. My name is Melody Devereaux. I was once a lost and lonely child. But now a new path awaits me. After so many years alone, I am on a journey that will... I hope, sweep away the shadows of the past. It's a journey to a new and exciting place, to a mysterious town at the edge of the sea, to new friends who will soon fill every moment of my life. Something has drawn me here. I don't know how or why, but as the train comes to a stop, I can see the name of the station. Clear as day. Collinsport. Dark shadows. Bloodlust. Dark shadows. Echoes of the past. Are you the Reverend Trask? The boy asked, with a look of apprehension on his face. I am. Trask responded with as much dignity and pomposity as he could muster which in his case was considerable. What can I do for you, my son? I have been sent, sir, by the family neighboring our farm, who asked that you come at once. You see, sir, they fear that their daughter has been possessed by the devil. I watched him head for the door, the film can under his arm. I thought about running after him. For a brief moment, I considered chasing him down the street, but then I sat back and breathed out. I knew he'd be back. Scene 17, interior, nighttime. 
The hall of a large house in the Hollywood Hills, run down, empty, abandoned. A title card reads, the following night, the monsters prepare to strike again. Each time I soak in the sight, sounds, and smells of the Collinsport docks, I remember why my hometown is so important to me. I'm destined to be here, destined to take the stand I've chosen to take. It's the best time of year, late spring. Mid-May, when the fish are biting and the azaleas are bursting into bloom. It's almost hard to believe when that breeze licks your face with its promise of the warmth of summer. Hard to believe that at the heart of such a beautiful place lurks evil. It surged through me, across the miles, and into the spider lurking in Barnabas's room. I could feel its instinct to run but I forced it still. It looked deep into the desperation of the black shroud, longing to be free from my control, but I held it as the power streamed from its eyes. Dark shadows, haunting memories. The rain pattered overhead with gentler, teasing fingers. Thunder rumbled in the vague distance like a bad case of indigestion. The eye of the hurricane was passing. No one dared move. All knew instinctively it was a false, temporary calm, lulling any who believed it into a rushing sense of relief and release. But soon the backside of the storm would swing over, and the banshee terror would gleefully return. In the dark, Lord, I am not alone. I know it, I feel it. Your presence... Your spirit close beside me, rushing into me with every lungful of air, punching blood through my body with every strong beat of my heart. And Gregory feels it too, Lord. Gregory's heart is strong. But with every pulse, his heart sends blood flowing through his veins and out through the hole in his chest. I was famished, but my need was not for food. I moved my tongue slowly around in my mouth, exploring gently, and then I felt them. The two incisors, sharp as needles. I sighed bitterly. I am a vampire. Correct, he laughed. (laughs) A reedy cackle. But why? I don't deserve such a cruel sentence. When she had exhausted all possibilities and peered down every street and alley of Collinsport, Elizabeth was hot and tired. She was on the point of going home when a familiar shape caught her eye in the window of Collinsport's one and only realtor. Drawing near, Elizabeth recognized a photograph. It was of the old caretaker's cottage on the Collinwood estate. She'd known David was selling it, of course. Elizabeth rested her forehead on the window to cool it, and suddenly, without warning, she saw it again. The face from the past, pressing through the glass against her own, as if to kiss it. Dark shadows, phantom melodies. With no time to lose, Harry slipped back into the tavern and hurried to the table where Carolyn and Roger were now deep in conversation. Excuse me, Mr. Collins, could I have a word? Carolyn was gripping Roger's hand tightly, giving Harry pause for thought. Mrs. Stoddard had only just died. Could Carolyn cope with losing another family member so soon? But Roger himself soon cast any thoughts of mercy from Harry's mind. I think you'll find, Mr. Johnson, that I have already said more words to you than should be necessary in anyone's lifetime. It is high time you left this town and stopped besmirching your poor mother's reputation. I opened the curtain, and the man was there. The man from all my nightmares, and he was he was different, and he was picking at the lead in the windows, trying to get in. I don't really remember anything after that. I just remember starting to scream, and then screaming and screaming. It wasn't just fear. I'm, I mean, sure, I was so scared, but I got angry because something from my stupid head was making me scared. Look, who are you? I'm you, Carolyn. I'm just as much you as you are. This is sick, copying someone's voice. 
When I find out who you are, you're going to be in so much trouble. I'm Carolyn Stoddard. I was born on July 16, 1946. My mother was Elizabeth. And what do you mean father, your mother was Elizabeth? She died a long time ago. What? Listen to me. I'm calling you from the year 2017. I'm calling you from the future. Amy walked only a short way before she found a small park where she sat on a bench. She took a deep breath and leaned her head into her hands. Was it always going to be this much hard work? She knew full well that the reason she'd left Didier at the cafe was what he had said about Roger and Elizabeth, about her seeing them because she was looking for them. How did he know that? Being intuitive was good, she told herself, but supernatural gifts were not. Dark shadows, dreams of long ago. When you gaze at your own reflection long enough, strange things begin to happen. At first, it's little things. Change in the shape of your mouth or a raising eyebrow. And then after a while, things start to get wild. Before long, I saw my face begin to melt and deform, first into a distorted vision of my mother, and then into something altogether more animal as though something primitive were dormant inside me, just waiting to take over. Quentin checked his watch. 1.43 a.m. on the year's last day. In a way a cloud can suddenly be a bear or a fish, the distant hiss became words. So long. Nearer now. It's been so long. Help me, Quentin Collins. I knew instantly the man was dead. His body sprawled across the rock in an uncomfortable, unnatural pose no living person could have borne. His shirt soaked in blood, almost black in the bright moonlight, from the deep wound in his chest. I felt a sudden, desperate pang of hunger, but forced myself to remain calm. I stared at the man, middle-aged and grey, unremarkable except for his dramatic death. Once upon a time, because that's how all stories start, there was an astrologer called Sebastian Shaw, and he had a unique gift. He really could see into the future. But poor Sebastian Shaw, he made one mistake. He never tried to see his own future. If he had, he'd have never come to Collinsport in the first place. He'd never have taken Maggie Evans to Wincliffe Sanitarium, and he'd never have ended up trapped there himself. <laughs> Dark shadows. Love lives on. Stokes smirked, finding the conversation fascinating. Looking down at what the woman was holding, his interest turned to annoyance. Madam, the item's in that box. Madam, the woman said with a flourish. How funny you should call me Madam. She handed the professor the box. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Madam Janet Findlay. Psychic medium. Stokes' eyebrows shot up and his forehead wrinkled. Professor Timothy Elliot Stokes. And there it was, previously obscured by the shadows. Sitting in the chair was a small, wooden, ventriloquist doll. To my horror, its head began to slowly pivot towards me, its eyes slowly opening, its mouth slowly opening. Please. Don't stand on my account, Mr. Stiles, said the doll. My name is Houche, Edgar Houche. She drops the pile of photographs onto the bar. It's more than just his eyes. It's more than just his face that's blurred. As if the photo had somehow tried to wipe the man she loves from its frame, smudging him away like a mistake that should never have been printed. 
The face that looks up at her from where the face of Willie Loomy should be. The face of her old husband, Ted. I pointed to a figure standing on our porch. There you are, captured for eternity, quite the honor. Nona leaned closer. The smile, it was true. And soon I felt bad for bringing her out of the classroom. What I had taken for a smile from a distance was more of a sneer. The lips curled up. Marv had captured the smirk of a villain, the queasy mischief of a confirmed killer. Well, Marv isn't exactly. A scream interrupted us both and we ran for the classroom. Annie was lying on the floor, the suitcase propped up on the desk before her. It bit me. Dark shadows, shadows of the night. Jude, ever since that amazing moment of truth in Grace Church on the night of your recital, I have been consumed by you. My every thought is of you, us, and the future. I don't know how Amy became so confused as to think it's her you love. I realize this has made our meetings awkward, and I thank you for your sensitivity to her feelings. However, I feel the time has come to make public our love and to disabuse Amy of her illusions. But please, sweet Jude, let her down gently. And then I see him again. Outside the cafe. Outside the cafe, and he's watching us. He's standing there, and he's watching us. And I know it can't be a coincidence. The Dark Lord must have sent him. And he's come after me because of what we did, because we escaped. So I, I jump up, and I run through the cafe, and I push open the door, and I run out into the busy street, and he's gone! The two of us spun around. Roger, framed by the light that sliced through the rest of the dark, he was gagged and bound to a chair. We ran toward him, and the moment Elizabeth removed his gag, he said, No, stop what you're doing. I suggest you simply do as they say. I was about to ask who they were, but my question was answered before I spoke the words. Two flashlights clicked into life, the beams shining in our faces and hiding the identities of their operators. Bethany continued. Ice would fill the house, she said. Then furniture moved, doors slammed, books flew through the air. And all the while, she would be immobilized, her body frozen stiff with invisible hands that pulled and stretched and burned. Gingerly, she pulled off her sweater to reveal ugly purple bruises on her wrist, across her torso, and down her back. Dark Shadows is a Big Finish production. <laughs>